Yeah, so so I mean, my background, I've been in the world of neurofeedback for 15 years now, believe it or not. So it's been, we're getting close to half my life uh, in terms of uh, being exposed and involved with biofeedback and neurofeedback. And it all started way back in 2006 uh, with the Biofeedback Foundation of Europe, uh, who is an organization still around and actually got involved. I was hired as a course assistant, uh, essentially. So I had privileged access, access to all of these experts around the world. Uh, and got to learn a heck of a lot from them and see a lot of really different applications for biofeedback in your or feedback, anything ranging from clinical practice or medical conditions to sports and high performance. Uh, and that ultimately led to a lot of clinical work. Yeah, Len Zykowski, the director of sports science, uh, got me involved in their program over there. And that's actually where I discovered NeuroTrack. And looking at NeuroTracker right away, uh, it kind of you know occurred to me saying, oh, well, this is really interesting because this is pulling on intentional resources, this is working memory, this is information processing. This is exactly what a lot of the clinical populations such as ADHD and learning disabilities need. Uh, and so when I went back to Jocelyn, uh, who was the creator of NeuroTracker or the 3D MOT in the form that we had it, uh, we started discussing that. Uh, and we discussed ways of being able to show that. And my tool at that point was the quantitative EEG, uh, so a functional brain scan, and it just made sense to at least start with a validation there. So we took a bunch of healthy university students in my master's thesis, and then looked at what functional changes we saw in terms of neuropsychological performance, so gains in attention, working memory, and visual information processing speed, and then also what was going on in the brain. Uh, and both of those changes were really interesting because it showed that NeuroTracker doesn't necessarily train a very specific skill, but a more broad layer of cognitive attributes and cognitive functions, uh, like I just mentioned, attention, working memory, and information processing. And what was cool is for everything except for information processing, which makes sense because that's the more fundamental part of the task, we saw gains cross modalities. So it didn't only stay in the visual domain, which is what NeuroTracker is, but it also went on to the auditory domain, which is cool because it's showing that it really is taxing and pulling on what we call a shared resource pool in psychology, where whether you're doing visual attention or auditory attention, both of them are needed or that resource is needed. So an example we give a lot of the time uh, is when someone's merging onto the highway, the discussion that they're having up until that point, which they're able to maintain, they're no longer able to maintain. They have to allocate more attention, more resources to the merger, which is a more complicated driving maneuver. Combining the two techniques is also very much of interest. But even just on the fundamental level, uh, again, I've been you know biofeedback, neurofeedback for 15 years, and what is super interesting about biofeedback and neurofeedback is it tends to train directly those physiological, cognitive, emotional, behavioral resources. So again, an example that I often give when teaching. Uh, is we'll talk about someone with dyslexia. And when we do neurofeedback on someone with dyslexia, let's say we take a pretty severe case, someone who no matter how much effort they put into it simply can't learn how to read. We'll start with evaluation. We'll notice it's the region back left of the head that's usually problematic and we'll train that region. We'll normalize its functioning. The person will have more resources, but they don't automatically know how to read. So the learning of reading still has to be done. And so the reason that's interesting in the context of NeuroTracker is because neurofeedback is a wonderful, wonderful system to develop attentional resources and inhibition resources, working memory resources, but it doesn't necessarily tax them directly. So what we do is we integrate what we call transfer tasks and those transfer tasks can be useful in developing those resources and a perfect transfer task or even a task after neurofeedback training to properly develop and tax those resources and develop them like reading is NeuroTracker. So NeuroTracker can be used to help people who've done neurofeedback. Once they're finished neurofeedback and prepare those resources, it's kind of like doing the landscaping before building the house. Well, NeuroTracker is literally building the house. So we can use the two of them very concurrently uh, in a neurofeedback practice to really enhance all aspects of someone's attention, working memory, executive functions, and then even bring in uh, stressors. And with the new technology that has gone into NeuroTracker in terms of adding stress, adding load, making it easier, making it harder, all at the right moment in time, because again, we're doing this always based on a person's performance. Well, biofeedback and neurofeedback can be used not only to measure how precise that is, how well it's done, but also the impact of that training over time. 
And then if you can use that information again from biofeedback and neurofeedback and feed it back into your system so that it adapts based on a person's performance level. And again, you're, you're just closing the loop essentially is just one of the main titles of my thesis. Uh, and that really does lead to the best performance all around. So the, the self pace was interesting because again, it was a discussion that Jocelyn and I had in terms of how implement uh, what my research was showing a little bit more quickly and bring it to market quickly. And the idea was uh, with the neurofeedback, again, NeuroTracker essentially did what we call target recall. So you're able to pick up the targets again, even if you had lost them from your attentional span or from that working memory buffer uh, on the fly. So neurofeedback does it directly. It kind of picks up that your brain is drifting off and it brings those targets back in so you can pick them up very subtly, always kind of progressive, always based on how the brain is functioning. And so that's a very raw measure. What we had kind of behind that, which was cool, was that uh, recall feature built in on the user side. So when a user senses that they've lost the targets, what will happen is they can press a button on the controller, which will bring those targets back in. They can also slow down the speed of the NeuroTracker trial, which is great because it also lets them maintain attention on those targets for longer or speed it up. So a lot of this all has the purpose of keeping someone within what we call the zone of proximal development. So the zone of proximal development is that sweet spot between being not solicited enough to learn and too solicited that we succumb to anxiety, stress, and our performance suffers. And so... The NeuroTracker is a very fluid task. There are lots of things we can change to make the task harder or easier. Two of them right off the top of our heads, we just discussed. The targets themselves, how long we have to maintain them in our working memory, how long we have to maintain our attention on them, and then speed. And with speed, it's actually a multi-factored variable because when you increase speed, not only does your information processing pick up, but you get more interactions between targets and distractors. And so you're taxing executive functions much more. So with that self-recall feature and that self-control that you can have, you can really push yourself to the limit while being quite comfortable in the NeuroTracker task, knowing you can slow it down, you can pull off that target recall if you need it as you're training. Yeah, so essentially, it's, it's to come back to the analogy I used earlier, you're reading a book, you don't quite remember a passage or you realize you get to the end of the page and you haven't encoded anything, you haven't really processed anything, you're on autopilot, well, then you're going to go back to the top of the page. But it takes you all that time to get down to the bottom of the page or to your next check before you realize, oh, yeah, I didn't really register any of that. Neurofeedback just shortens that loop. So it brings it in much quicker because as soon as your brain drops out, it triggers that recall. So it's interesting because I'd actually be curious to test both systems because I'd have a theory about what would be different in both of those systems. I think in the first system, neurofeedback, because it is very, very quick, will probably develop attention a little bit more. Whereas when it's self-guided, that demands self-monitoring. So you actually have to be aware of what you're doing and aware of your performance, which is a really high order executive function. So in theory, the argument is there that that could actually improve executive functions a little bit more than the already very good neurofeedback hybrid paradigm, uh, which would probably work a little bit more for information processing, attention, working memory, uh, and those kind of what we could consider lower level functions. There, there are two really, uh, two major advantages to combining them. So for those who are using NeuroTracker uh, and maybe aren't quite familiar with biofeedback and neurofeedback, the first thing uh, is we can actually develop more resources again. So what we're looking at with NeuroTracker is building better attention process, building better visual information process, and building better executive functions and working memory. Now with neurofeedback, what we do is we can unlock more potential to gain more ground. So to develop higher order and better functions. So essentially you're enhancing connections that will allow better learning within that neurotracker paradigm. So already a performance boost will be there. With biofeedback, the example you gave earlier is perfect. It can be very simple. It can be five minutes of what we call heart rate variability training. So cardiac coherence, breathing at a certain pace, which will actually augment brain functioning and performance. And it does it for everything from NeuroTracker even to reading in dyslexic patients. One thing that is often overlooked, the second side of that coin 
is you're assuming the person doing NeuroTracker is performing at a high level and that everything is clicking to an order uh, in order to allow that high level performance, but you're not actually measuring it. So I would argue that an often neglected side, but a side that is pretty easy to implement is to look at what happens in terms of physiology when the person is performing at a high level. Because some days we notice NeuroTracker, our performance just isn't there and we don't always know why. And so I'd have that physiological side to see if their breathing's off, to see if, yes, they're tired because they had a bad night's sleep and their brain is showing signs of fatigue. Uh, or for instance, yes, they're a little bit more tense, they're crisping up their muscles. This can lead to very valuable information that you're gonna wanna apply when the person is performing in their sport. Because again, the beautiful thing about NeuroTracker is we can adapt it in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, I think we've all seen those videos of people stick handling and skating on a ice treadmill uh, while doing NeuroTracker. Uh, it's absolutely incredible. So this can help us pick up on subtle things that we might not be picking up on, that muscle tension that might hamper st uh, stick handling or make them cough up the puck or just burn more energy and deplete endurance and resources. This can all be picked up with added modalities of biofeedback and neurofeedback.